helps to be on. Okay, okay, how's that? Okay, as, as this indicates, uh, we're going to be talking about the uh, petroleum geology, the petroleum geology of the, of the, of the uh, north of the equator, specifically about the Laramide orogeny and things that happen associated with that. And the areas that I'll be talking about, basically you can see uh, here, everything that's in red I'll basically be talking about. Three of these areas are just hot spots. That's the Emperor Hawaiian hot spot, that's the Icelandic hot spot, and that's the Reunion hot spot. Uh, nothing will be talked about uh, south of the equator, however, only about a quarter of the world's land mass is actually south of the equator. Uh, but every one of these areas you can see, that you show here, you can see evidence of the Laramide orogeny. In fact, in most places in the North American, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, you can actually see evidence of that. Uh, and this kind of is a good slide for basically figuring out what's going on. The Mesozoic Mountains are colored in this purple color, the Paleozoic Mountains are covered in the brown color. Now, they don't break down the Mesozoic Mountains, whether they were or actually Jurassic in age or even Triassic in age uh, or, 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 or Laramide. But you get a basic idea of what's going on from here. Uh, this basically shows you uh, where the, uh, the, the, the different areas I'll be talking about, uh, all the way over here in China, over here in, the, in, the, uh, in both these areas. This area here is away from the plate boundary. These are two. Uh, Maracaibo Basin is very close to the plate boundary. Again, you get away from the plate boundary, you'll be talking about Senegal, also about uh, the Dutch North Sea, and uh, a collision zone over here, which is uh, the Persian Gulf, and a collision zone here, which is the Indian Plate. Uh, not the best of slides, but the best one I could find, considering. And what it basically shows you is uh, the, before you had the Laramide Orogeny 80 million years ago, here, by the way, I'll define the Laramide. I started 75 million years ago, to about 42 to 40 million years ago. So Campanian, to me, would basically be not Laramide. That's part of the severe. And what you find out is these movements come in initially, start slow, reach an impact, and then start waning out. And what you also see is the severe and the Laramide sometimes is somewhat interacting. We'll see that basically here. Here in Campanian, these are severe orogeny movements. By the time you come to 70 million years ago, which is mid-restriction, that's where I really break off and call it the Laramide. You can see you have somewhat similar zones here. You develop now one over here, which is in the Alpine, but you develop a frontal zone here in the Rocky Mountains. Then you go to middle Laramide, and you really start developing this, uh, the, the collision zone down through here, all the way down into Indonesia, Indonesia. Further along in the end of Laramide, you see all these things basically tapering off, uh, the folds being mainly formed already. And then you start to get in uh, really the effects of the Alpine Himalayan orogeny. By the time you get here, Oligocene, you're in middle Alpine, which is, a, to me, a, a separate orogeny. And here's how these things break right down time-wise. This is Nevada and Orogeny here, again, around the Jurassic boundaries. A little bit starts down here, and it kind of comes up into here. I break down the uh, uh, severe Orogeny is kind of starting in Aptian and Albion time and going all the way in the, into uh, Campanian. Uh, and actually, in West Africa, the, the big movement in West Africa would be the Santonian movement. That affects all of northern Africa. Uh, here it's not as great a movement, but you have some here also. And you go into the Laramide, it starts in mid restriction and goes all the way really to the end of the Middle Eocene. Some people would take it all the way to up in here, but I break it off around 40 million years. And we'll see reasons why this as I go through here. Up in here, farther up, we get into the, the, what I call the late Alpine equivalent orogeny. Uh, many people in Europe call the, the Laramide orogeny here the early Alpine. Here again, it depends on where you are in the nomenclature. Uh, so what were things like in, uh, at the beginning of Laramide time, this is 75 million years ago, if you're a reptile, life was good. You, you hadn't had the Lickin traps uh, extruded, you didn't have Chicxulub, Bullite impact, shallow cratonic seas, less desert. Reptiles actually lived as far north as the Arctic Circle. They had a high plant and plankton level, and ensured the higher handles on the food chain had plenty of food to eat. And by the way, most of the fossils we get are around, for these uh, reptiles are around these uh, shallow seas. Uh, now we're going to see, go into the source rock that were initiated uh, during the Laramide movement. What you basically see is this. Uh, there's a whole slew of source rocks that are formed along the old Tethian enclosure zone. For the most part, these are associated with 48 basins down through here. As you get into China, you develop rift basins that uh, were formed as a result of, uh, of, the, Lar of the, the Laramide collision of India with uh, uh, Southeast Asia. Over here, you have some rift basins here. 
that a Laramide age once here, the Green River Basin, which is the one probably most people know about because it's very organic shales here. You have some in Nevada here. You also have some you know, foreland basin shales here. You actually have a source, uh, a rift source here in, uh, in offshore Nicaragua. So let's talk about the volcanism that's accompanied the Laramide movements. We'll start here with the Deccan Traps. Deccan Traps was a huge uh, outpouring of, uh, of uh, vol uh, basalt. It started the reunion hotspot right in here, and this is Madagascar, sits right here. This is the Seychelles Islands, eventually the Masquerine Plateau will be sitting down here. But that huge volcanic outpouring uh, gave you these Deccan Traps. That, that actually is the longest lava flow in the world right there. Uh, you look at over here at the plate tectonic history, these are the matching halves. There's my uh, Seychelles Islands, there's my, the other half, which is in around Mumbai, India. And this part here moved down through here, this part here moved up through here, and this is where India slammed into Asia. Now we take a look at how, uh, how this relates to the bolide impact. People say that the dinosaurs were all killed by the bolide impact. What you find out is, dinosaurs got, started getting stressed here about 65, 67 half million years ago. But look what happened here with the uh, Deccan trap extrusion here and here. Uh, this was a complicated factor. I'm sure it was the uh, nail that got driven into the coffin and nailed it shut. But you had a lot of stuff going on in here. A lot of CO2 coming into the atmosphere and affecting things. This is actually a very good uh, paper. It's written by Tappan Yeh, 1986, out of the Geological Society of London. And what you basically see is this. Tappan Yeh took a regular squared off piece of uh, plasticine. He drove a piece of wood or iron up through there to find out what would happen, if he could, see if he could explain Southeast Asia. What you see is a bunch of series of very strong faults, one down here, one here, one here. This is stage one, this is stage two. And how does this relate to uh, Southern Asia? What you see is India is driven north up here. India you know, actually continent to continent collision uh, from, best, from the best results that I can see occurred around 50 to 52 million years ago. You were actually it, uh, had the prism intersecting, uh, northern Pri uh, India prism intersecting uh, and interacting with this continent before that, but the actual uh, real continental collision occurred then. What happened? Well, there's all these big faults you see here. That's how it, Southeast Asia get explained. This was the oldest one here, the youngest one, uh, medium one here, the one up through here. As far north as uh, Lake Baikal in, in uh, Siberia, it's an Eocene lake. This is essentially caused we had compression between here and essentially stable point down here. It uh, opened a rift up in here. It explains why you get all these Chinese rift basins. So what happens when an immovable object is hit by an unstoppable force, both deform, and that's what you see here. That's how you explain Southeast Asia. So now we're going to go on the impact uh, uh, of the Laramide movements on the southern uh, Eurasian margin petroleum systems. We'll start out here in India, mainly the Indus Basin. I'm not going to get down into the area down right here, which is a little bit farther off, a very lower Indus Basin into the Cambay Rift. I won't discuss that, although it's a pretty good petroleum system, it's rift associated. You see three basic slides, uh, uh, three basic uh, Indus basins. There's the upper, middle, and lower Indus basins. Each one of these basins is split by a major peripheral high, uh, and uh, it subdivides those basins. There's the upper Indus basin. You had old Eocambrian salt through here. Uh, there's some evidence people say you actually had an Eocene salt phase, but more likely it's probably a tiered canopy that came up from this old Eocambrian salt, Eocambrian being uh, late, very late Precambrian. So that's what the uh, northern Indus, Indus Basin looks like in through here. Now, on all these slides, when you see the red unconformity, that's the base of tertiary unconformity. You'll see another unconformity start to come in a little bit later. It's going to be the basal Coniacian unconformity. Both these unconformities had a big influence on carbon, uh, excuse me, hydrocarbon distribution in different basins around the world. And we'll see that especially around the Sabine uplift, and we'll see it also in the Persian Gulf. Middle Indus Basin down here, you see a longer foreland. There's, there's your 40, basal 40 unconformity surface coming through here. And what's that really telling you? It's telling you you collided with something uh, near, the, near the base of the tertiary because you don't get these basal 40 unconformity surfaces unless something's moving down into that trench. It's the northern, uh, con northern uh, uh, part of India being sucked it down into that, it sucks down into the uh, uh, oceanic trends. It gives you that pop up of the Cretonic area to the south. Down here is the lower Indus Basin. Uh, it's a little more stable down in here, uh, and you actually have fields down here. One of them's Cash Kelly. It's, it's, uh, it sits below the uh, uh, the Deccan, Deccan basalt, uh, Deccan traps there, and those reservoirs there are older than the Laramide. Now we look over here, we see a kind of a strat chart here. This is the basal strat chart. You see now crops down through here. This is the hydrocarbon distribution in the Indus Basin, the upper, the middle, and the lower Indus Basin. 
Uh, even though there are a lot of tests in here and you have a lot of uh, little oil fields in here, one of the bigger fields sit along this zone right in through here, which are basically a, a big tear fault that comes along the edge of this peripheral high. Uh, now this is a, a cross section here. You can see it comes across the Kurth R40 and it basically goes this way. Uh, and it actually comes across Kuiper High down through here. Uh, and what you see is basically the Maserati structure, which is a deep fold. Then you see the basal 40 bone conformity surface coming up, and you, Kuiper High sits on the, uh, above that in the Sui Main Limestone, which is ESC and age. That's the main producing unit there. And then Mari Field is another uh, uh, fold that formed out through here. Uh, another, another view of the, of, uh, of the, uh, lower, uh, the middle end of the basin it comes off the, uh, uh, the uh, Jacobabad High. Now, Jacobot High is pretty much uh, above this, the Sui Main, you get 80% nitrogen and CO2. You get very little hydrocarbons in there. You come over here, you get about 65% CO2 and nitrogen. By the time you get down here, you have almost no CO2 and nitrogen in, in a relative sense. But the type of structure you have here and here are a little bit different than what you have up here. This is basically a drape structure over on a peripheral high. These are actually thrust folds. He doesn't show them. There's thrust folds that come up through the section attached. Uh, it may be partially wrenching, but they look to be detached over thrust when you look at the seismic. Okay, now we're going to talk about the eastern Eurasian margin of petroleum systems, mainly China. I'm not going to get into to the Assam Basin. Uh, mainly the Bohai Basin. We'll talk about that uh, to begin with. So, Larry might remember this was once in the frontal zone to this collision, and you opened up all these rifts down through here, Bohai Basin being one of them. So, what does uh, Chinese Basin Petroleum Geology look like? Uh, it looks like this. Your main play in the basins, if you can get it, are the buried high, the buried hill highs, the ones that sit kind of in a roof high. And you look at karsted carbonates, which are, which are uh, uh, very lower Paleozoic and maybe actually late Precambrian carbonates here. Where they get leached at, what unconformity surface it says, is the basal tertiary unconformity surface. Where they get leached at that and karsted to develop great reservoirs. Renke field here in the pre rift sequence is more than a billion barrels of oil produced. Then, but you also have fields up here in the center of sequence. Da Qing is four or five billion barrels, and that's in uh, Sanglao Basin in China. But Sanglao Basin is a little bit different animal. Uh, that, that, that rift basin is as big as the state of Texas. Up here you have the uh, uh, Gadawo field, another billion barrel field, but it's in the post rift sequence. So you get all three of rift sequences that produce billion barrel fields. Now you take a look at what Renshu field looks like in cross section. There's your tilted high down within the rift. You have a seal problem up here, but down here you don't because you have lacustrine shales that give you a seal. It sits at kind of this inner rift high down through here. Now here's a line, a baseline I'm showing here, the base of tertiary unconformity. Look at all these Chinese rift basins that opened at base of tertiary time. That's really telling you what's going on. And what's really telling you is that's when the Indian plate really started interacting with uh, uh, Eastern Asia. Uh, there is a cross section that runs from here to here. I believe a piece of it's right here. You get an idea of what you're looking at. These are different layers of uh, karst levels uh, uh, within that Renshu field right in here. Again, that's a, uh, more than a billion barrels of oil in that field. Now we're going to move over. Oops, back. Now we're going to go over and we're going to talk about this seamount chain, the Emperor uh, and Hawaiian seamount chain. It sits right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It starts right here at the Aleutian Trends. Look when it started, 70 million years ago. That hot spot was generated up here start at about 70 million years ago. What, when is that? That's the beginning of Laramide time. Now look down here at 43 million years ago, which is getting close to the end of Laramide time. What happens? Major job. Now you get more into the, into the late alpine systems. And of course, Last night, you had a little volcano down here called Luihi, which is about 6,000 feet above the seafloor. So it's been moving in this direction. So we started moving here. It took a major jog here. All that's Laramide time. But the end of Laramide time, it started moving here. So it's, it's telling you that Laramide movement is affecting many different things. We'll see that also with other hot spots. We've seen it with two already. Now we're going to look at essentially what you see with uh, uh, the western side of the United States, specifically the Laramide basins uh, in both Utah and uh, the Great Plains area. This is severe overthrusting in here, and by the way, when you see un uh, severe unconformity, the basal Coniacian unconformity, that's one of the severe unconformities in here. Active uh, thrust belt here, ma mainly detached up through here, but we get, and also you have an active uh, 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 volcanic arc. This volcanic arc generated this, this back arc thrusting. But then you deactivated the arc, and all of a sudden, uh, and people say that basically what's happened here is you had high angle seduction down here, volcanoes coming up through here from a, from a crustal melt zone. Then what happened is the, uh, the uh, uh, slab 
subducted at a lower angle. Because it, slow, it subducted at a slower angle, you had a wider period of magma injection. And that's where you get in this interplate of volcanism you have there at Laramite time. And also, you started to, because this happened, you started developing uh, uplift blocks there at Laramite. This, this is entirely different than that. Although sometimes the, towards the edge, they tend to get involved, especially in central Utah. Uh, this is an ulterior viewpoint of the same thing. This guy says that at the beginning of Laramite time, you had an arc reversal. That before, you were subducting North America down through here below a, a fictional continent he called, ribbon continent he calls Rubia. But at the beginning of Laramite time, you reversed your subduction. You went the other way, and that's why you have the, the volcanoes out here uh, and the, the old highs like Sierra Nevada. And that's why you have uh, the uh, uh, intrusions you have like the Black Hills area here that are Laramite in age. And that's what these look like. That this is not an extrusion. This is the uh, Devil's Tower here. It's a Laramide Age uh, intrusive volcanic feature. This was buried. This was buried uh, uh, down in the earth, but uplift associated with the Laramide uh, uh, orogeny uh, as a, essentially uh, causes the surface to be denuded. Now you have these vol uh, these uh, uh, igneous sills, uh, or excuse me, lacoliths that come up through the ground that have been exposed. There's where, there's where you are. So you can see way out in front of that frontal zone, you're getting the effect of the vol volcanics here. So we'll take a look at this. We'll take a look at what's going on in the Rocky Mountains. Now, the companion stuff you see here is probably severe, uh, not, really, uh, not, not really a Laramide in my mind. But look at what happens in the restriction time. What happened, used to be a few basins over here in companion time being activated. Look at all these basins start to get activated. And then even later, and then all the way through here, even look at these, how these all get involved. We're going to see also this in the Dutch North Sea, but keep this in mind. So when did they all end? Late Middle East, about 43 million years ago. But how does that all relate? There's my pre, pre larry my Campanian music, uh, movements. This is all these arrows you see here are extensional zones. That means compression was occurring here and here. And it shows you the fold trends that you developed during the, uh, the, the severe movement. Now look what happens in middle layer of my time. You've rotated the, the uh, compressional zone towards the, towards the counterclockwise. Now you've got middle Laramide folds formed here. Late Laramide folds, Eocene folds formed down here. And all of a sudden, these east-west trending gravids become under a lot of compressional movement. Consequently, up comes the Uinta Basin. You say, well, that's fine for the northern part of the United States, but what's happened to the south? Well, look at, the, look at down here. Look at the direction of compression, direction of compression, direction of compression. Look at the years, 75, 63, 55. It's not too different than what we see up there. It keeps on going. Now we're going to go down in the Rio Grande Rift. First, we'll take a look. Before we do that, let's take a look and see what these different uplift structures look like. Uh, some of them are pure basement-driven basement uh, reverse faults here where you get uh, small tertiary cover or basement. Some are the old David Stearns kind, classic upthrust vaults, like what you get in the Delaware Basin, but not Laramide and Age, be more paleozoic. And some of them are simply high-angle shears that come off through here. You see these in all these different, uh, all these different structures have different components of the same structure. Now we're going to look at Salt Creek Field. Salt Creek is not a small field. It's a very old field. It's discovered in the early 1900s. It's been developed with 3,000 wells. Its cumulative production to date, at least in 2005, was 800 million barrels of oil equivalent. So it's not a cheesy little field. What does it look like? This is a geologic cross section. You have sour oils here, sweet oils up in here, same source. Sour oils versus sweet oils. They basically typed it to Cretaceous age. This is what a seismic section looks across that same structure. Now it's at the surface. That's what I was found. It's found by mapping anticlines. Now we're going to look also at Cave Gulch in here. Cave Gulch is another one of these situations where you have a very steep folding right in here, faulting system right here, these two faults up in here. When you get up into here, there's, there's this almost tertiary, basic tertiary right on the basement up and through here. And there's a fold down through here. This is a relatively recent uh, feature. It's been found, I think, in the 2000s. EUR is a 500 to 1,000 DCF of gas. So it's basically hidden for a long time because they had to shoot 3D to get it. Take a look at what, what, uh, what you have for reservoirs. It's basically restriction aid sandstones, the land sandstones, which sit right in here, and, and Fort, Fort, Union, uh, Fort Union sandstones. All these produce, these are all basically Laramide sands. Remember also, this is still our, our base tertiary unconformity surface for reference. <laughs> Another, another field that's been found, uh, was discovered for what it really is more recently, is Jonah Field. And what you see is there's a cross section that runs down through here. You've got two ceiling faults. These faults have almost no throw. If you didn't know it was there, you wouldn't want to drill this prospect. And it's kind of got stumbled upon. So we'll see what it looks like. 
This is the base tertiary unconformity surface. The actual units go from there to there to there. This is the base of the lance. You're still in the lance all the way across through there. These two wrench faults seal. Top of pressure jumps all the way up into here below this coaling member, sanding member within the uh, uh, Fort Union itself. So basically, a very little throw along these faults it looked to be inconsequential, but they're sealing faults. And you look at all the reserves you trap. That's a multi TCF gas field. If you didn't know it was there, would you even drill it? Now we're going to talk about the mid continent uh, uh, Paleozoic Petroleum System. Mainly, we're going to talk about the Panhandle of the Yukon field. Uh, and this had some uh, 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 laramide aspects. Uh, this field's produced uh, to date 75 TCF of gas and 1.4 billion barrels of oil, mainly out of uh, Wolf Camp age, uh, I believe it's actually Permian age, uh, carbonates, the Chase, the Council Grove, and whatnot. Granite Wash is your main migration route up through here, and you'll see it on the next slide, I believe, uh, the next slide beyond this. Now you get an idea of what's going on here. Why is this field so big? And what you'll see is essentially there's a permeability barrier over here. Even though you had tilting for here and tilting there, this permeability barrier has essentially kept the gas in. The leak point somewhere up here along outcrop, and you see it down here. That's your leak point, the, the, the valve that's letting off uh, uh, the, height of, uh, the, the water from this direction to redistribute traps as they went through time. Again, there's your carrier bed, which is your granite wash. Now we take a look at what's going on in cross-section. This is the panhandle field here with the gas here and the oil on the flank. Uh, and you see there your source rocks are down in here. Pretty much it's the Woodford Shale. It comes up through here. It gets involved in the granite wash. It just leaks all the way up into here. And it goes to, it goes to the place where it first has a great seal, which is the middle Permian evaporite system. Again, you have a gas cap, 75 TCF of gas, and oil rim at 1.4 billion barrels. It's all shallow, folks. There's nothing deep about it. Uh, now we're going to look at Permian. What was going on in Permian time at the same reservoirs? And what you see is uh, uh, down in here, here again, your non-reservoir permeability barrier down through here, here, and here. There's your hydrocarbon accumulation right in there. Okay. Now we look at what's happened here. We've had uh, uplift in this area up in here. You had Cretaceous tilting in this direction in the western interior seaway. So you've tilted back up in here. What's that done to things? Uh, really, at this point in time, which is Cretaceous time, the giant structural taps of the, uh, traps of the panhandle field were large enough to hold, at the pressures they had, all the, old, all the gas now found in the mid-continent mid Permian reservoirs. This is all uh, uh, Sorgeson's worth, I believe. Uh, now, look what happens here. In the early tertiary Laramide orogeny, everything reversed. You had maybe a tilt in this direction, now it tilts back in this direction. Uh, and you, you start getting a rotation of the old column, the gas tap starts coming up in here. Remember, we have a, a seal up in here, a non-reservoir non, uh, permeability barrier that's holding everything in. But at this point in time, uh, you, you're starting to get water discharge at outcrops uh, uh, at, at lower elevations. Now we'll go to late tertiary, okay? Late tertiary being much farther out than Laramide movement. You've seen further migration. This time the oil is migrating up into here. Uh, and now you see uh, uh, how the, uh, now you've got a minor gas accumulation down here, the bulk of it's up in here, but you still got your, your, your oil point right in here. Water flowing all the way to the outcrop. Remember on a couple slides ago I showed you how oil went to the, uh, water went to the outcrop over here. You see what's happened here with the pressure diffusion that went from here to here. That's being controlled by that valve there to the, to the, uh, to the east. Now we're going to see what goes on in West Texas because uh, uh, yes, I wouldn't say a similar situation there, but a little bit different, but somewhat uh, similar in the Laramide. And this is a work of Bob Lindsay and I think uh, another guy. I'll go through the slides. Uh, Trenton did this, I think. Uh, during the Laramide Raja, you brought this section up in here. You tilted the traps there in, in, the, in the Permian Basin, at least this portion of the foreland down through here. And then you rifted it in, uh, in, uh, in the Ligocene time, formed the Rio Grande Rift down here. And you drop this stuff down through here. But uh, as you brought these, these mountains up in here in West Texas and, and New Mexico, essentially gave you a freshwater recharge area to the west. And this is what it looks like. Water's coming in through here, hydromatic flows, bringing it down through here. It's affecting all these fields down through here. Uh, and uh, the central basin platform, I think in this area over here, the middle and, uh, middle and basin. You get lineament escape down through. You have a lot of sulfurous water where this happens, by the way. So here's, here's what they're showing in the way of meteoric drive. You'll notice that uh, down here, you're kind of the, uh, the traps down here, dynamic system. You've lifted this up, you add a meteoric drive, all of a sudden you get this residual oil zone that's still kind of there. Uh, it's not considered to be producible, at least until recently. Now they're really kind of studying and realize that there is a lot of oil left there. 
So what happens when the entire old column is swept by Mother Nature? You're left with one hell of a tertiary recovery project here. It's called residual ozone there in West Texas. This is from Trenton's article. You say, well, how big is it? They're talking about 31 billion barrels. We're not talking cheesy here. It's pretty damn big. Uh, and these are for the different shelf, shelf carbonate systems they have down through here. Remember, the carbonate's your main feed point from the west. So how do these different uplifts, post premium uplifts, how, what are the tectonic overprint we're seeing here, and what kind of meteoric fleshing do we have? We see it started basically in layer of my time. One can, one can actually maybe even take it all the way back into severe time. Uh, it depends on how you work your, your chronology. But also you had, it was affected by basin range too. So you had the tectonic overprint of a two and possibly three cycles. Now we'll look over here at the uh, Eunice uh, monument, uh, unit, monument South unit right in here. And we see our edge water down through here, and uh, the air, our ROZ is going to be somewhere in here. I didn't dwell a lot on those last slides because I, I, there was something added late to the report. I just wanted to show you how the layer might affect the Permian Basin, because it did affect it in a big way. Now we're going to take a look at what goes on in, uh, in very northeastern Mexico. There's a cross section right in here. Chinamarks just right down through here. Uh, we pretty much stop our exploration through here. This, these are Mexican fields down through there. That cross section is here. Now notice the difference between this. This is Laramide overthrusting over here, associated with the uh, 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 with the Western Mexican movements and the rise of the volcanic masses to the west of Mexico. Here we see a Laramide lystery growth fault, completely different. All uh, uh, hinges on the difference on that platform. Over here, it's completely different what you have over here. Although some of these folds demonstrate actually some wrenching movement. You actually see what it appear to be bent some of these folds. They're not typical growth, growth fault and anticlinal structures. We're going to take a look down here. Remember Chin and Anticline I showed you in the last slide. Now we're going to see the southwestern Texas heavy oil pro, uh, province. This is Ewing's work down through here. There's Chin and Anticline. That's definitely a rift inversion feature. Look how this has been pushed up over an old rift. It was once low, and these were all, these were all horizontal points through here. But Laramide uplift has caused this chitomanocline to come up. You say, okay, there's our, there's our cross section through here. Well, what's happened? Well, a lot's happened. For one thing, the anacultural uh, limestones up here, they got asphalt quarries at the surface in Uvalde County. You also have all, uh, asphalt, uh, folic santos outcrop in Uvalde, uh, Uvalde County also. These would be restriction aid sandstones. Okay? And then you've got several unconformities through here. He calls this a sub-Indio unconformity, and then he calls this the Bigfoot, which is actually, I think, interlaramine. And there's another one down through here that, uh, that I didn't color in here, which should be the, uh, uh, the basal coniacium unconformity. Uh, now we see uh, where the heavy oil zone lies. Here's a chitomanocline. It's all down through here. There's your asphalt quarries and the anacacho. There's your, 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 uh, your uh, San Miguel play right through there. Now, these authors here, you can see sequentially, starting in 1983, 1994, year 2000, they all tried to explain Mexican tectonics with one orogeny. It's not one orogeny. It's three orogenies, possibly even four, if you consider the alpine. started out in Nevada. This guy said, well, everything is Nevada movement, so that's going to be late, early Cretaceous and late Jurassic. This guy said, well, no, it's got some severe input in there, so let's put some severe folding in here, too. The final guy says, nah, it's all Laramide. This is all Laramide. You guys are just getting confused. That's the year 2000. Let's take a look at map view and see what's going on. These are the, uh, the severe folds. See right through there? Those are severe folds there. Uh, and those are Laramide folds through there. So you can see how the severe and Laramide interact here, but these are definitely farther afield than severe. This means Zawatanehu in Mexico. I've been there actually to fish, caught a big fish there. Uh, down here, this is a whatnot hey, and now you can actually see the trans mexican volcanic belt, which basically came up in the Oligocene, and some volcanic trends lying down through here. So again, this would be late alpine kind of stuff, but it's influenced things also. Now we're going to look at the figure, figure 5A in here, which is taken from Alzaga Ruiz in 2008. Cross section down through here. Let's take a look at what's going on in the Golden Lane, the Poza Rica area. Uh, what we see here is, remember, here's our red unconformity. What is that? That's our base of tertiary unconformity surface. Notice, in base of tertiary, this area was exposed. Remember, you have, crate, uh, you have uh, formerly deep water areas over here. It got uplifted. You had classic sources building deltas out through here. What's well, sealing in the Golden Lane unit through here, or bottom sets shales, uh, sealed from the delta delta uh, uh, sequences prograding from west to east across the Golden Lane. That's why that, that, that surface is so sealed. And it's actually come up. We'll see that as we go through here. We've got uh, pr uh, production here on the Golden Lane. Yeah, we have production here in the Golden Lane. Two wells in the Golden Lane produce, have the 
highest, most individual uh, productive wells in the world, one that produced 84 million barrels by itself. But if you look at what it drilled in, they drilled into karst and carbonates. They lost probably 8 or 10 million barrels out because it blew wild for, for days. They had to pull it up and dam all the rivers and creek to keep the oil in. And it blew the, uh, I think it blew the uh, traveling block and everything about 600 meters from the, from the well side. That's how strong that, that system is. Down here you've got Poza Rica. These are basically uh, basal debris carbonates that sit uh, west here. The reason why Poza Rica is a big field is you've, you uplifted this to the west. It created a reverse dip on the old four slope wedge. Remember, everything at one point in time was pointed down to here. Laramite pushed it up to here, so now you've got a natural stratigraphic trap. On top of that, we're going to basically see the Eocene sandstones, which are the uh, uh, Chicopontepec sandstones. Here's what it looks like sequentially. Late Cretaceous to Eocene, what we're seeing is there's our lower paging uh, Chicopontepec sands right down through here. It's kind of mid-process in the Eocene. There's my Tuxpan platform. You'll notice it's exposed here and exposed here. That's actually sea level running through there. So you actually had marine uh, area down through here. There's these deep water sandstones. Then you come into the early Miocene and you see it's got lifted up more. And these are Miocene rocks down through here. They show Miocene rocks maybe coming down through here, but I don't really know that that really happens. I think probably you get Oligocene rocks uh, from the cross sections I've seen. Again, what sealing is? They'll take bottom set shale seals. This is not uncommon. You get these back arc thrusting episodes, and you get uh, basal folding basin or basal 40 unconforming surfaces. Usually, when you get these 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 deltas building from former uh, former uplifted uh, marine areas, you get these great seals formed out here. That's what that's what seals in the, the fields below the. Uh, uh, late Devonian, the Mississippi, and unconforming surface in Kansas, Oklahoma, and West Texas. Now we're up to the present day, and this is what it looks like right in here. And these are the big fields, Poza Rica, onshore and offshore Golden Lane. Uh, what's Poza Rica look like? It's really, structurally, that's it. There's no incline there. It's just a plunging goddamn nose. In the syncline, it's wet. As soon as you hit the bottom of that syncline, no more oil. It's gone. But up in here, it is. And when you drill on this side, and they've drilled down into the, the uh, 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 debris zones down in here, they're all wet or wet. So, there, so you have to have that syncline in there. From what I've heard, also, it's some similar situation to what we have the, the Wolfbury play there in West Texas. Once you, once you start coming up onto the forest slope of the reef, it's toast. You, you start going to water. Uh, this is an isopac map of, those, uh, of the, uh, the Poza Rica zone producing zone. You can see it gets up to quite thick up here, 250 units, goes all the way down to zero over here. So it's just a natural pinch out trap on a, a larabite nose. Here's what it looks like in perspective view. There's that toll, toll margin fields in the Golden Lane in here. Look at all those fields down through here. Remember, two of, the, two, two of these fields were almost one well field. One well fields, they produced like 80 or 90 million barrels. That's before they had good casing and, and, and good mud and whatnot. This is, shows the karsting you have there on the platform margin. You can really see the karsting, how it fluids is on a, on a time seismic map. Chicopic sandstones, uh, you know, they show this kind of a Middle Eastern canyon, but I suspect the actual unconformity surface is here. You have an inter interaction with the late uh, unconformity surface coming up in the three. It's cut down even deeper. That shows the production zones in the Chicontepec here. Again, there's your gold lane. There's your Chicontepec. And this holds, what, four or five billion barrels. You may get a billion out of it if they're lucky, many because it's really, really heavy and they're dirty kind of sandstones. This is what it looks like in crossing. You always wonder what it really looks like inside. And that's it. There's my Middle Eocene nonconformity surface cutting down through here. There's my Upper Cretaceous up through here. There's my Jurassic. My, my source is actually down in Kimmeridgian, uh, Kimmeridgian, uh, 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 the shales here. And that's what sourced almost all the oil in Mexico. That's, and you don't have a source of well developed there in, in the north part of Mexico. That's why you have all the gas up through there. Again, here's your reef. Uh, this is going to be the base of the upper Eocene right through here. And you have another middle Eocene unconformity surface. It kind of gives you an idea of what's going on. Uh, and here's what it looks like. Uh, there, there's your Compit Canyon through here. It's actually a, a basal, it's, it's a bottom of a 40 deep in here, but you have actually a canyon empties out through here. Now we're going to look at these sand rich fans in here with the Paleocene, Eocene, Wilcox sedimentary sequence. And guess what we have? Remember, you left out the whole, whole west end of, of North America all the way from uh, the United States, all the way down through Mexico, you get about one hell of a sediment source. You also reverse a lot of uh, drainage. That's part of the reason why the western interior seaway disappeared. You start out lifting that, the water just evacuates from that area. Uh, but associated with that also, you're going to get one hell of a regression. Any sand that was stored up deep in the Lugo valleys, psh, out it gets flushed down dip. And that's what you see in the down dip Wilcox. That's what you see all through here. That's why you have these massive submarine fans down here. These are all the, 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 the sands that were stored during the late Cretaceous uh, transgression there. And you can get an idea of seismic. Look how this is a very small scale seismic. Look at the thickness of these fan systems down in here. 
tremendous production. I'll probably get about 15 billion barrels out of that. Now we're going to go into the onshore Central Gulf Coast Petroleum Systems. Uh, basically what you can see here is Sabine Uplift, and you'll see multi multiple very giant oil fields and sometimes super giant gas fields associated with the uplift of the Sabine. It actually had two stages of uplift. What you see basically is when you come off the trans the large, go to the southeast. When you don't have these periods of uplift, everything subsides to the southeast. When you first start to see uplift on a place like the Sabine, that's when the movements are starting. Now, most people will consider that to be um, middle, middle uh, actually uh, early lower Salamanian time, but actually it started in the main, main Street limestone time. I know that because the Main Street limestone thins over this high. Just because the movement starts doesn't mean it reaches its apex. It's, uh, but, and of course the end of that movement uh, here is going to be the uh, uh, basal coniacium nonconformity surface. It's got rejuvenated Paocene Eocene time with the Wilcox group. Notice how you've got a fold there even now on an outcrop on the Paocene uh, Eocene Wilcox group. Uh, this is what Adams does. He said, well, you got the Santillo, uh, St. Lawrence shear. You've got East Texas field up in here. That's six billion barrels and may produce as much as six and a half billion barrels. But look what else you have here, Lamy, Indiana field in, in, in western Indiana, eastern Indiana, and western Ohio. That was the first field ever, giant field ever found north of the American continent. That's produced about 400, 400 to 450 million barrels of oil, and it's found like 1880s or something. And, uh, and uh, about a tea and a half of gas, all from shallow, uh, shallow production. Originally, they were looking for, for, uh, for water, and they accidentally struck a giant field. Now, here, here's a, one way to look at it. This is done by Jackson Lubbock. Well, how are you getting these folds so far away in an interior plate position? They go, well, you got a four deep over here. You got a four bulge over there. That's my San Marcos, sorry. And each one of these hives over here must just be a kind of an extension of this whole system. But this guy down here says, well, no. This guy says, well, if that's the case, you should see similar unconformities in all these hives. Well, you don't. This one came up in the basal cone uh, in, in, in uh, uh, Turonian. Eagleford and Woodbine time, basal coniacin field, seals East Texas field right here. Then you come in late on, this is what really gave you the big, the big traps you have right here. Even though you sealed it down here, you didn't have the traps till you have it. What's the problem? Well, once you start stop the movement, everything subsides down and all the traps just leak out. So you had to rejuvenate this, this structure here to get these traps to come in and be in be, being. Look over here. The unconformity, which is a no-go over here, that's the big one over there. It's not really all that big. It's top Taylor unconformity, which is late severe. That would probably be San Antonio in age. East Texas field gives you an idea how it's trapped on, on the very edge of the fluvial system uh, on the Woodbine Delta. This is what it looks like. Remember this unconformity? I said I'll show you the basal un uh, coniacin unconformity surface. There it's sealing a six billion barrel field. You got Austin chalks, which produced down to it. But up deep here, they're, they're so shallow uh, uh, and they've not been heavily structured because it's such a broad uplift. They act as a seal. That's East Texas field. I got a side line back in my office across it. I'll tell you, if you didn't know it was there, trust me, you wouldn't know it was there. Uh, this, now we're going to go into Monroe uplift and Jackson Dome. Both these are related to the, the Laramide movement. Now you got uh, Paleocene, well, they, they say they got Paleocene carbonates over these. Uh, over here, this, to me, it's kind of questionable here. It's somewhat questionable, too. It may actually be. Uh, uh, well, it is Paleocene carbons, but it's, it's not, they, they say it maybe goes down to Navarro time. Here, here actually, you can see here in Navarro, this map, the si sections you're looking at sit along this plunging nose. It's basically a, uh, uh, a permeability barrier trap. One point in time, probably the high was over here, and he, and he tilted out in this direction. You'll see a series of rotational cross sections run from north to south across this high. Starts up in here. Here's the Monroe gas rock faces, Navarro age, which is very late uh, 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 Cretaceous. Down here, the next one down, you've gone to here, and now you see the similar situation down in here. Remember, these are two unconformity surfaces, base of coniosity and base of tertiary. And then it goes to here, and all of a sudden you look to either you have a reefing build up there, or you just cut a great big channel down through this reef. Over here, it's a similar situation, you just don't know. Down here to Tuscaloosa, you go to the south flank of, this, of the Monroe uplift, and this unconformity seals in Delhi field, which is about, uh, I think, about two to, 50 million, two to 250 million barrel field, similar to East Texas, just on a different high. Again, had similar history. Now we're going to look at laramide uh, volcanism associated uh, in these aborted rift basins in, in the Gulf of Mexico. The laramide volcano, and on top of that, you see actually got volcanic uh, vents they've actually hit. And by the way, you got multi multi TCF CO gas tubes or uh, fields are located just east of this dome in uh, Buckner and Smackover uh, formation carbonates. 
But what you can see basically is a reef developed over this old, uh, uh, this old uh, Laramide volcano. You see this in, in, uh, uh, in I think, in, in the end of uh, uh, Santonian time there around the volcanic escarpment. But this is where it's actually a bigger volcano. Uh, by the way, the location of all this is right here. That's in western Mississippi. Now we're going to see Maracaibo Basin. Uh, probably a third, more than a third of my talk is really uh, more like about half is is uh, is in these these USA persistence and stuff in China. Now we're going to see go down the Maracaibo Basin. It actually had Laramide movement too. In fact, I have a cross section I meant to bring. I just couldn't get it colored up. But you had Laramide movement. Uh, it's, uh, there's evidence here. You had Laramide movement starting really in restriction time, or reached kind of an apex there in Eocene time over here in the Maracaibo Basin. They call it the Incaic in, in movement here. You'll notice there's my basal tertiary unconformity surface right up in here. This would be probably the base of the uh, upper alpine unconformity surface. Notice the different fault styles you get here. You start with Hercinian faults down here. Apparently, these must have been somehow reactivated because what you'll see is sweet spots, uh, hydrothermal dol dolmens actually curl on these faults. Some of them also, these, these faults right in here, which are Jurassic Age faults. Eocene faults here, not so prevalent, and also Miocene faults. We'll take a look at the next slide. And here's what we have. These are the sweet spots mapped by, uh, uh, by seismic attribute facies. The, everywhere, you look, every, everywhere you see is green in here. It is, you get good, great wells in here. You get off the green, you get kind of doggy wells. And you look to how this works, you see uh, you're charging your heart to through it's come out through this basal sandstone, come all the way up along these fault planes and joints, reach up in here and start really putting a lot of hard thermal dolomization along through here. And it's so heavily dolomitized that you actually have a lot of uh, reservoir there. Now we're going to talk about North Sea. We're out of, we're out of uh, the Western Hemisphere and now we're in the Eastern Hemisphere. But I have to start now first with the, uh, the Greenland ice spot. And what you see now is the Greenland high spot. Let's take a look at what was going on over here. That was Greenland high spot there in early tertiary Paleocene time. Look at all these middle Laramide plat plateaus with salt you're getting here. Essentially what's happened is the rock hall plateau split off from Greenland and started moving away. And that's what we see over here. This is all very young crust. It's early Laramide opening over here and late Laramide down through here. Laramide being, that's major crust down through there. Now what we see here is what's happened here in Europe with the spreading center you got here and the northern movement of Africa you got here, this whole system been caught in a vice right through here and you get a lot of uh, inversion <coughs> through there. And what you see is basically this. There's, again, our same uh, movement's been colored through here. There's my early Laramide movements. Now notice how it compares to what we have here. This is the, these are the ones, by the way, in, in the Netherlands Basin. How it compares to what you have in the Rocky Mountains through here. Notice you have a mid Paleocene lower. Not a whole hell of a lot's going on. You have the same mid Paleocene low over here. And the middle, Al middle Alpine movement comes in later. Uh, down through here, what we'll see is three rotational uh, cross sections again. One here across the, de de the Dutch Central Graben, one here across the Broad 14 Basin. I worked this area right through here, and one's in the West Netherlands Basin, which is mainly offshore. The show point of all this is Groningen Field, which is a supergiant gas field. Notice the uh, unconformities. There's my Subrosinian unconformity in here. What is that? That's essentially my uh, basal coniacian unconformity surface. They, and that, they could call a movement over here called Subrosinian. They call this Laramide. They, they term all these alpine movements. That's why you get kind of confused when you go from Europe to the United States. Uh, again, there's my basal uh, tertiary unconformity surface down through here. Look at all the folding and uplift and inversion you get against that surface down through here. This again is the central Graben, Broad 14's basin. This is the West Netherland Basin. Over here, this force block that sits over here with two Grabens on the side, that's growing and high. So really what happened here, uh, you essentially changed things quite a bit. Uh, some of the best fields in your, your basal Cretaceous uh, uh, reservoirs, and these are the ones that overlie the Nevada and Unconformity, that's the one down through here, which is Jura Cretaceous Unconformity. Uh, in, in the uh, lower, early lower Cretaceous sandstone. Some fields contain very whole, uh, heavy oil with API gravities of 13 to 20 degrees, resulting in low recovery factors uh, in some of these fields. It, the result of biogradation and onset of the, at the tertiary because when tectonic inversion reservoirs were then at or near the surface and what you did is it got biodegraded. Further north, you actually strip off all these reservoirs. In other words, here they're present. When you go further north, all these get removed and there's just no reservoir to have. Uh, this is a, a shot at Groningen Field. These are religion, religions of sandstone. These are basically uh, uh, desert dune sandstones of uh, 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 Permian age. If you had a, 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 a 
not the stratigraphic, uh, not the, basically a temporal equivalent would be these mobile bay fields you get in the Norfolk, but that's what you have. They're a very continuous zone of very good quality reservoirs. You can see here that essentially the base tertiary has been uh, offset down through here. You got, but you had the trap. The trap's actually quite old. If you look at it, look at the folding you're getting right there. Look at the base of Nevada and folding you had up in there. This was eventually down here and it kind of moved back up. So it's even influencing that field there. And now we go into the Pyrenean foreland basin systems. We're going to go into the lock field here in, in very southwest, in fact, France, uh, French uh, Spanish boundary here sits right in the foothold of the uh, Pyrenees. Stratigraphic section here, we got oil in the upper Cretaceous. It's basically sealed by that base, uh, basal tertiary conformity service. The bulk of production comes down here from the uh, Neocomian, and most of it comes from this upper Jurassic uh, carbon section, but you have some vertical leak leakage along joint system. That's a lack field in there. It's the biggest sulfur field in the world uh, that's uh, got hydrocarbon associated with it. Uh, now we see, look at the cross section. There's my Jura Cretaceous unconformity surface that sits right there. There's my basal Coniacin unconformity surface that sits right up there. There's my basal tertiary unconformity surface that sits down there. It gives you an idea of how these three different uh, uh, unconformities react on one high. Now we're going to get a better look at it here. What you see now is the basal Coniacin uh, surface here. You see the Nevadan surface right in here. Notice how all the hydrocarbons are stacking up along here. It's only what you see up here is the leakage you get along joint systems from down in here. So your main, your main seal where you can get it is here. It's along that Nevada nonconformity surface. Now we take a look at the cross section. Here again, you've got a little leakage up into the Neocomia. Your main, main reservoirs are down through here. For the most part, the Neocomia represents a seal down through here and down through here. Where it's on top of the fold, been highly fractured, it becomes a uh, uh, it, becomes, it becomes a reservoir there. You notice also that there's got a, it's this uh, oil field here sealed at, uh, at below the uh, base, base tertiary unconformity surface. Now we're going to the or, uh, northwestern African margin. Mm -hmm. Getting close to the end of the talk down here. I'm going to show you two areas, one here in the High Atlas and one over here in Senegal. This movement in, in northwestern Africa, now really Africa is really actually part of, I would consider even Spain and, and part of the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Plain to be former Greater Africa. But, but as far as the, what's considered now to be the, the, the normal uh, Africa we all know today, I'll, I'll bring you into two systems right here. What you see is essentially uh, uh, the uh, Laramide movements tend to more disrupt reservoirs and to uh, cause uh, seals to leak. We'll see it first here. Notice how you had Triassic, Jurassic, Rifton, Cretaceous substance over here, and the Laramide inversion come through here. This is the High Atlas. You've got breach hole fields there in the High Atlas. There's not really much in the way of a play there because everything's either by degraded or, or breached. And then we see over here we're going into Senegal. Now we're going to see the Rafis Kai over here. Dakar High here is a volcanic volcanic uplift. The Dakar High came up and there's a major unconformity surface that sits at the base of tertiary over this high. And you have a deep low down and through here. Uh, actually, I'm mapping right here. That's why I kind of know about this one. Uh, we look at Refuse Dome. It was, if the problem with Refuse High, why did it not produce? There's my basal coniacy. Hey, it should be a great seal. It should have great fields there. But the problem is, this is crappy section to seal with. We don't have these bottom set uh, deltaic shales here. We have a lot of silty, sandy shale. It's just a very poor seal. There's my basal tertiary uh, unconformity surface. You can kind of see it's actually subsided a little bit. Take a look at what it looks on seismic section. Here are all these oil shows you get down through here. They're live oil shows, but it's all leaked up section. There's actually a small accumulation here. Notice my basal coniacin unconformity surface here, and notice my basal, basal tertiary unconformity surface there. Now we look at what happens on the Arabian plate margin petroleum systems. I think we're almost to the end here. We're going to look at Greater Bergan. We're going to look at North Pars and South Pars fields. And what we basically see here is an Eocene opening of the Red Sea. Uh, and what you have is an area that's actually tending to try to rotate away, or maybe place trying to rotate away in this direction. And in the process of doing that, it created this Zagros crush zone over here. You have giant fields sit over through here. You have giant fields sit on the uh, base of, uh, on the, uh, on the uh, stable flank of the foreland, and that's what we'll be looking at. We'll be looking at the stable flank foreland fields, but they show evidence that during uh, uh, restriction, and very late restriction and Paleocene time, you, these folds, uh, you had at least 10% short in that area right there. Bergan field, largest field ever pooled in sandstones in the world. 60 to 32 to 60 billion barrels of oil, mostly in sandstone. Now, some of it's actually in carbonates, but the bulk of it in the war sandstone, the Bergen sandstones, a little bit down here in the Balogene and Brazilian carbonates, a little bit down here in the lower Jurassic carbonates. Notice the relationship of what is my basal coniacy, and there's my Nevada, and there's my basal tertiary. This cross section we see here, we'll see next. 
figure 14, that's what it looks like. There's my basal tertiary unconformity surface. Look at, look at the thinning you're getting at that surface right in there. This fold had a layer of my growth. You look down below that, what kind of thinning you're looking at down there? Very, very little thinning. It looks like it's really non-event. So this field essentially came up, and it's a layer of my field. Again, our unconformity surface, basal tertiary, basal coniosteous surface, and the basal rotation of the vatted surface. South Pars field and North field. First, we'll take a look at what goes across section across the uh, Cutter Peninsula up in here. And what do you see here? There's our two unconformity surfaces. There's our basal coniosteum. There's our base of tertiary. You can see the thinning of the entire upper Cretaceous along the arch of this high. But not, and some thinning may be possibly down through here, but nothing like what you see in this section right through here. How did Northfield form? What, what is Northfield? Well, it's basically, uh, in many respects, a stratigraphic trap. It has some, a little bit of closure, not a lot. What's your seal? The seal is that unconformity surface right there. What is it? Basal coniosteum age. How would this compare with the Sabine? Same unconformity, same seal. It's not the same seal. Here it's, here it's going to be shale on the speed uplift, it's going to be the Austin chalk. But the age, the age of the sediments are basically the same to seal with. Now, when you uplift it here, they call the regional mistrip on conformity surface here at basal, basal coniosteum time, you just leached the hell out of these, these, these carbonates in here and formed a great reservoir. You carsted them to the point where you can actually see the karst zones on the seismic. You can actually make sweet spots using attribute studies to basically uh, map the reservoir. Notice what you have here. There's a fold down through here, but it's been, it's, look at the seal. Seal's dipping in this direction. The whole thing plunges down to the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, to the northeast. This is this is a peripheral high. Remember how I said often when you get these peripheral highs, there are major places to develop giant fields. What are we looking at? We're looking at the ones on the on the central basin platform of West, uh, West Texas. The the, uh, the fields you have uh, also in Kansas. Uh, the, the, these peripheral highs are prolific producer of Romish Kino field and Soviet Union. These are all prolific producers. They all see their peripheral highs of 40 because they have such a huge fetch to draw the rolling gas from. Now we'll take a look and we'll see how this explodes out to this right in here. Actually, this is right down through here. Uh, there is my peripheral high down through here. And there is Northfield that sits right through there. Now let's look at a cross section of Northfield. Uh, by the way, I think it's about 150 TCF gas. That's what they say it is. Uh, I don't show all productive zones in here, but there's my mixture of limestone right in there. It's been very heavily carsten at that surface. There is my local reservoir enhancement below the unconformity. Now, this is the base church for unconformity down through here. Where's my seal up dip? Is there any? It's strapped. It's strapped the carbons. The seals, the up dip carbons, it didn't get, it didn't get, uh, it didn't get uh, leached are your seals. So here's the conclusion. I'm glad at this point. I'm sure you are too because it's been a long time. Uh, you had Laramite source rock development that occurred in 40 basins along northern India, onshore China, Rocky Mountain Rift Basins, Maracaibo, Pannonian, Pannonian and Persian Gulf Foreland Basin. These are all different areas that had source rock development. And for the base, basically what you look at, the reason why you had the, foreland, you had the uh, source rocks developed along the Foreland Basins were basically, for the, with the exception maybe of the Maracaibo Basin, uh, you're looking at the old Tethian closure. That's what caused the, the, the uh, source rocks to, to, to be deposited where they are. But you get into China and the Rocky Mountain Rift Basin. These are rift-related basins. You're seeing river, Green River Shales and the Green River in that basin there. Those, uh, uh, those are all rift-related. And, and the ones you have in China, again, they're Middle East Eocene shales, are all rift-related, they're lacustrine shales. So where'd you get uh, reservoir developments or existing enhancement occurred in China, Rocky Mountain basins, eastern Mexico, and northern South America? Where are your best reservoir seal developments? They occurred in northwest Pakistan, onshore China, rift basins, Rocky Mountain basins, the Mexican foreland basins. And some of these seals actually formed after the, uh, or very close to the end of Laramide time. Laramide oil and gas traps formed were modified in China, Rocky Mountains, West Texas Permian Basin, Central onshore Gulf of Mexico basins, uh, Mexico, Northern South America, Northwestern Europe, North Africa. Uh, by and large, I didn't show a lot about Africa because I just don't underst understand everything I think I know about North Africa. We'll probably see more as I go along about North Africa. So right now, it's just kind of a question mark in my mind. The Laramide Age hydrocarbon expulsion from Laramide and pre-Laramide source rock units occurred in China, the same basic zones down through here. And a lot of the hydrocarbons that are pooled in these areas here come 
with the exception of the rift basins, come from the deeper, from the deeper source rocks. For instance, the Maracaibo Basin, much of that production comes from uh, a lot of lunar shale, which are mid-Cretation, and sedimentary and trillion shale. But you do have a, uh, an ESC, uh, upper Paleocene Eocene source, but it's mainly a, a gas source there. Now you get hydrocarbon distribution in these, in these pilaramide pool hydrocarbon that occurred in the USA, Rocky Mountains, I showed that. Big continent, basically showed that. Permian basins. This is more nebulous because it hasn't really been worked out totally deep hole, but it's actually also occurred there. We see it also in Western Europe. I didn't get elaborately into that because I want to keep the slide within the, the, the talk within a reasonable amount of time in the North Sea Basin complex. But you had also laramide modified hydrocarbon traps were breached and degraded in some areas, including uh, uplift, uplifted Colorado Plateau, Atlas Mountains, North, North Africa, where you actually have fields that have been, fossil fields exposed. And some hydrocarbon traps along the inverted margins of the Rio Grande Rift. Uh, and also, you had igneous advance, intrusive and extrusive, accompanying the larified movements in many, in many areas. And that's basically it, folks. <laughs>